we have today uh, the, the great pleasure to, 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 to have David King uh, visiting Aalto. David is the, I guess, with Katri Pulkin, uh, the initiator of, of why we have classes for systems thinking in the, in, in, in the program. So Katri, I'm not sure, I think she's, she's, she has been traveling, I was unsure whether she's here today, but she, she's coming right. Okay, great. Well, uh, then we'll have the two initiators, but today the floor is uh, it's for David, and uh, David just told me that uh, he has been working for a long time with IBM, yeah. uh, so we'll hear probably, maybe you tell a bit your, about your background, but mostly it's uh, systems thinking. So please, David, the floor, floor is yours. We have reserved time until, well, uh, but uh, that's discussing presentation. Okay. Yeah, you Great. have the show. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. Just <laughs> um, starting off this class reminds me of uh, one of the stories I heard about an American professor teaching in Germany. And uh, what would happen was that the uh, American professor would schedule the class for uh, six o'clock at night, and all the students would show up late, ten minutes late. And so then he decided, well, if they're going to be 10 minutes late, then you know, we could try, try encouraging the students to come on time. And so then he, uh, uh, then he said, OK, well, we'll start 10 minutes late. And so uh, could we please come at 6 o'clock? And they say, yes, we'll come at 6 o'clock. And they come at 6.10. So then uh, the professor says, well, OK, um, we really need to cover this amount of material. We need, really need to start. So I'm going to start at 5.50. And so he said, we start at 5.50, and the students will show up at 6 o'clock. And so there's an interesting story about cultural differences. Um, I, I, in the uh, at University of Toronto, where I studied originally, it was the same sort of thing, that traditionally, when you say a class starts at 10 o'clock, it actually starts at 10.10, because they need time to for people to transfer between classes. So um, the, uh, the, the question about when you start and when you're on tight time, when you're on slow time, what the practices are, always interesting when you're doing a lot of lectures in different places. So, um, so I'm David Ng. Um, I'm going to provide some context, uh, and the, I'm going to provide a little bit of, of um, history. And it's turning out that the, um, the, whole, uh, the, uh, the whole lecture is going to be somewhat historical. Uh, for those of you who are looking for ways of studying content, one of the ways is through history of science. And so this is actually a history of science talk, uh, although it's disguised as something a little friendlier. And, um, and, and just talking to Miko at the beginning, it occurred to me that a lot of people don't have the context. And so what I can uh, point out is uh, in 2010 and 2011, uh, uh, there's actually a paper about this course written in 2010, uh, written for the uh, 2011 ISSS meeting, and, uh, and it was about the formation of system thinking and the creative sustainability program. So uh, this goes back into uh, 2009, um, in early 2010, and um, I've been uh, here uh, so, uh, for quite often, and so I started at IBM in 1985, retired in 2012, um, but I've been going back and forth uh, to Finland. I had a friend, David Hawk, who was cross-appointed, uh, he was um, from the New Jersey Institute of Technology and was cross-appointed to Alto University. And so I started in 2003 here um, to teach in the executive PhD program at Tuta. Uh, and uh, while I was there, since I'm a PhD dropout, for those of you who are discouraged, I started my PhD in 1982, working on it. <laughs> Hope to finish this year. Um, the, um, uh, he said, well, you might as well finish your PhD while you're here. And so I came, uh, uh, and, uh, and the teaching, uh, the, PhD, the executive PhD program evaporated after about two years. And so then I, I ended up being this very strange PhD student who is older than most of my instructors, right? Mm -hmm. That sort of situation. <laughs> and working at IBM, uh, I had this interesting discussion with the uh, research director after I'd been there for a couple of years, and he comes and says, oh, we notice that you're not progressing on your studies very rapidly. Uh, I said, no, no, you don't need to, you need to understand. My goal was to finish my PhD before I retire. Mm -hmm. And he says, oh, but you know, if you need some help, we think we can get you some funding. And I said, um, I doubt that government funding for a university student is better than an IBM salary. And he said, ah, got it, take your time. 
So I hope to finish next year. I'm in chapter five of nine of my dissertation on open sourcing while private sourcing. Um, but um, that's kind of a long story about why I keep coming back to Finland. Um, and, the, and the circumstance for this is I, I was uh, president for the International Society of System Sciences. And I'm going to talk about that history that I started in 1998 and the context for that, because <laughs> history is important in how these things evolve. And uh, around 2008, 2009, um, I was, uh, actually I met some people from, uh, from um, there is a systems program in engineering uh, over at Tuta, uh, and I met those people actually when I was traveling in the UK at Hull University, and they have to be coming through because I was traveling. And through that, uh, there was a student uh, who was teaching a program in systems thinking over at Tuta, but the course was in Finnish. And so he said that he might be able to teach the system thinking, but teaching a system thinking in English would be a lot of work. And so uh, when this program was being formed, the Creative Sustainability Program uh, was underway. Um, it's, it's an interesting history. I was going to come in just in the history yeah. part's coming, so it's good. Moving <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so as the Creative Sustainability Program uh, was being formed, this was at the same time that Alto University was going through the merger, because I was actually at TKK, the Helsinki University of Technology, and, this, and the idea then was that there would be an innovation university where you merge the, these ideas of engineering, business, and design. And so at that time, the first, very first interdisciplinary program that came out was the Creative Sustainability Program. Now, you could call this you know, really good planning or just luck, but what happens is that they coincide exactly the same time. So, so this Creative Sustainability Program was the very first interdisciplinary program, and you see it in the way it's designed, as, as people who are in the program would know, because it's like, okay, you can get an engineering degree, or you get a real estate degree, it, it, there's different ways of getting this, and so it's really innovative in the design of the program itself. And it probably took, you know, I don't know, three, four, five years to get the whole course approved. So the coinciding of all these things at the same time is an interesting, interesting phenomenon. Um, so those of you who are in the program, um, it's, it's, it's funny for me to be here now because I'm talking back in 2010, and the program has been existing for five years, and, and people who come to this program think, oh, this program's been around for a while, it's been doing this sort of stuff, but it's actually quite innovative and it's quite new. Um, one of the things that was in the original program was there were two courses in systems thinking. Because if you are starting a new program in systems thinking, uh, sorry, a new program within the EU, if, with this type of program, they said, okay, you need to have systems thinking. And all the educators seem to agree that yes, you need systems thinking. But this is a problem that, okay, they put in two courses and no one knows what system thinking is. Like really, the, there, there's a challenge. And the system thinking kind of went up and down through the 1980s. And then there are some who claim that system thinking died. It's actually been fairly strong and consistent in Finland, but the content outside, and if you're looking at English language content, um, has not been so popular. So trying to work through all of that, I ended up with this opportunity, which was, well, I could work on my PhD some more, or I could come and write two courses and help develop the knowledge on system thinking. So what has happened is that the Creative Sustainability Program is one of the leading programs in the world on systems thinking, but it's not the major. Systems thinking is not the focus that you, like, you don't end up with a degree in systems thinking. Uh, there's very few places you can actually do that. But that's because it's fundamental be, and, and to, the, to the way that people think, and so it's foundational. So for those who are interested, um, on my website, I'll show you in a second, uh, there's a link to a paper, and then this is a sort of um, a way that I had presented. <laughs> and so going through history. Oh, yeah. <laughs> they already know this history, so they don't have to arrive on time. Maybe this guy's arriving on time. It's okay. So, so there is a paper about this program. So if you want to know what this program was about and how it was designed in 2010, it's on my website. Um, and um, which brings me to the presentation. Um, I'll go down one. So uh, it, within the slide deck, uh, if you go to coevolving.com, you'll find um, the presentation. It's the, uh, the one on the top right now. But Can you put it back? Yes, yes. Co -evol just go to coevolving.com, you end up on this web page, and then you go to publications, and publication gets you over to this page. So. Okay. Um, so 
it, it's been interesting that I, I come here and I normally have been giving talks about the research I'm working on within systems thinking and uh, last time I came I gave a talk on service system thinking. Uh, there's been vid there's videos on the web about it, so okay. I'm still working on service system thinking. Uh, I've been working on a PhD, so I actually don't have a new talk. And so I was thinking, well, what can I talk about that these people would be interested in that they haven't heard before, and you're not going to hear from Catherine tomorrow, <laughs> right? Because there's no point in me telling you stuff that you're already going to know. So I thought, okay, um, historical perspective is important. So I'm giving some history about this program, but what I want to talk about, and the reason I call it, it's actually a journey in some prospects, is that systems thinking is a very, very large domain. And there's a lot of people working in it. And so to be authentic about this, I want to talk about my journey, which may or may not be relevant to people, um, and some prospects which may or may not be relevant to you. Because uh, one of the things that happened is, uh, Katri, you went to Berlin, right? Yeah. Yeah, so I have been at every ISSS meeting since 1998, except for uh, 2001, because the 2000 conference was really bad. So I thought I, thought I was going to drop up, but, I went, but I've been at every meeting. I chose consciously not to go to Berlin this year. But then it ended up I went to some other conferences and people go, wait a minute, well, why didn't you go to the ISSS meeting? And it's like, well, it's because I, I really should have been focused on my PhD. Sorry, yes. Sorry, ISSS being? What? International Society for the System Sciences. All right. So we'll get into a lot of that. That's what most of the talk is going to be about. So, so the, I, the ISSS meeting, um, uh, I've been to every one, but I didn't go to the one this summer in Berlin. And then I would go to some other conferences. And then the question is, well, why are you doing this? And in order to explain myself, I found myself backing up all the way to 1998. So this talk is going to, um, is going to go backwards. Um, and here it is, the International Society for System Sciences. Um, there are some web pages on here. If you go over to the Quick Pass, you come all the way down, you'll find retrospectives. And so this page is available to you. And this is the way that I got into the system community. Uh, what my claim was, uh, uh, and, and still is that the 1998 ISSS meeting was the single best educational experience of my life. Like you know, I've been a lot of time in universities, I go to a lot of classes, but this one event was enough to change the way that I think about the world, and enough to change the way that I I do my daily practice, the, all these sorts of things. And so I've said that many times, and people go, oh, okay. And katri has been to the conferences now, and she's, she's becoming a regular. So it's like, so she kind of gets the idea, but people don't understand why it, why it was such a big influence. So I thought, well, maybe that's what I'm going to talk about today. Um, so I'm going to have to talk about that. Uh, it's going to get personal for a little bit, because I have to go backwards from that as well. But I'm going to center on, uh, uh, on the 1998. Now, one of the things that I was doing, and, and this happened um, at 1998, was that uh, G.A. Swanson was the president and he was running the conference. And what he did was he noticed that I was sitting in the audience, I was taking, lap uh, taking notes. And he asked, what are you doing? And I said, well, I have this habit when I go to conferences is that I, in effect, blog them. Today we call them blog them, blogging. In 1998, no one knew what blogging was, right? But in effect, I blog all the conferences. And so all of the, these are the conferences that I blogged um, I also tend to record the audio, and I have video. The video takes a long time. Audio is easy to do, but audio, uh, video takes a long time to process. So we have all of these artifacts, um, which are, in effect, my lens on the systems community. Because uh, you'll see that I, I, I always have this disclaimer at the beginning, which is I'm typing these things as people are giving the presentations, and so it could be wrong. If you really want to know if this person actually said something or not, then you need to go back and talk to that person. But on the web today, it's easy for you to go and take a look and say, and, and you spend 30 seconds or a minute reading through this, you go, this is interesting or this is not interesting, right? So that's been the purpose of my blogging, is, uh, is some of the blogging is long when I write it, but then when I'm doing, in effect, reporting work of other people's conferences, this is quite helpful. So I did it in uh, 1998, 1999, 2000. I uh, went to Shanghai and went to Crete. 2004, I was busy, I didn't do that. So 2005, I did it. Uh, and then kind of go through and we start getting into the digital age because I can't run a camera and uh, type at the same time. So we tried various combinations, but that, that's the history. So well, what I'm going to do is kind of step through uh, some of that content. Uh, this is the original web page for the 42nd Annual Meeting, International Science System Sciences 
held at Georgia Tech. Um, this is the team that organized it. This is G.A. Swanson. Now, I'm going to explain why I got there, because uh, it's, it's like, well, why would you go to a system science conference? Um, here's my advice for you and professional development for you. If you don't understand a field and you want to know what's going on in a domain and you have a tolerance for ambiguity, the best way to learn about a field is to go to the conference that everyone goes to. And you will be the stupidest person at that conference. Which is fine because you're not supposed to be there. So one of the examples of doing that um, is in teaching this course, I decided that I didn't know enough about resilience. And so there was the Resilience 2011 meeting. And so I go to the Resilience Conference, I'm surrounded by all of these people who are resilience researchers, and some of the leading people, the Stockholm um, Resilience Center people are all there, and there's history about how the Stockholm Resilience Center people got there. Uh, but all these people are there and they're presenting. And um, a, a, a little bit of a side note, uh, the, uh, the resilience people have what they call a resilience workbook. It's on the web, so if you want to know how it is that you should be approaching the domain of resilience from the way that they do it, then you go to the resilience workbook. And I looked at this book, work, work, workbook and I thought, this is pretty good. It's a pretty good thing. I, I wonder what happened to it. So, so I go to uh, the Resilience 2011 conference, and while I'm there, I start seeing all these presentations. Uh, at that point, Eleanor Ostrom, who was a Nobel Prize winner in economics, was one of the speakers at the conference. Great. And so she says, oh, you should go to, um, uh, to talk about this one, this one researcher. Uh, you'll find, probably find it in my, uh, since I blogged that conference too, you could also find my notes on that. But, uh, she said, you should, this is a really good researcher, you should go and see this researcher. So he had a talk, just a regular paper session, so I go to the paper session. And, uh, and so he, uh, he gives this talk, and it starts off, well, so uh, I forgot exactly the circumstances, but he's from somewhere um, in Europe, and he gets EU funding to do research on resilience, and his interest was, um, why is it that some communities are sustainable and others are not? And so... Uh, the way he was approaching this was he, he discovered somewhere in the Mediterranean there were these two towns and they're on two separate bays and one bay in one bay the fishing community is thriving and the other one the fishing community is dead. So the first thing I learned about uh, about um, ecology and researchers uh, that do resilience work is they love natural systems they, they especially love lakes. Why do they like lakes? Because you can study one lake that's thriving, and then one mile over from that, there's another lake and it's completely dead. So you've almost got the complete control group when you're studying. You could say, this living, which one's dead? What's the difference between these two lakes? And that's what this uh, a researcher was doing, was there's this bay that has a community that is thriving, a fishing community, another one that's dead. What's the difference between the two? So scientific method, that's a good way to study. Right? So he... He has his funding. He goes down and, uh, uh, and goes down to the village and, get, and goes, and goes uh, to talk to the fishermen to say, you know, I'm a scientist. I'd like to get in your boat. I'd like to observe what you do, which is a good scientific method, right? The fishermen say, no. Who are you? Why would you want to get on my boat? I don't know who you are. It takes him months of living in the community before they finally get to know him and they go, oh, okay, get on the boat. Like, oh, okay. That's an interesting story, and I kind of uh, popped in the back of my head. And then I go to the seminar on the resilience workbook, and they're kind of stepping through it. And so they talk about um, uh, about doing the study and designing the experiments and sort of stuff. And then they talk about um, about getting the sample group, the data group, and they talk about inventory. Inventory. Um, it, it turns out that they, that uh, the inventory is what they call the number the people that you're studying. I go, why would you call this inventory? And, and then, then it occurred to me that these are botanists, biologists, they're used to counting trees. So the way they think about social system is the same way they think about the trees, they count the trees. And I'm saying, does that mean these people do not understand social systems? And in effect it is, because the people in the resilience research centers are biologists and botanists and ecologists, and they actually don't understand social systems. So anyone who's here who has a degree in political science or has studied that sort of stuff, you're way above what people are in the Resilience uh, Alliance actually understand. 
And the only way you can find that out is if you go to a conference that you know nothing about anything, and you go there and you say, I had no idea. Like, I thought these guys were the leading researchers of the world. And yes, they are. They're doing great research, but they don't understand political science, and they don't understand sociology very well. So for those of you who will get to a Catry session where you eventually talk about socio-ecological systems, and you kind of go, that's interesting. Why is it called socio-ecological systems? There's also social ecology, which is a different field. Why is it called socio-ecological systems? Because it was ecologists that came at it and said, we need to study the ecology. Ecology, you know, we need to change the world. We need to do all this sort of stuff. And then, oh, there's a social issue. We can't get any change. So therefore, we need this new field called socio-ecological systems. And that's where history of science makes a difference, right? You would never have known that, because now you see it and you go, oh, the, they're doing socio-ecological systems. I go, yeah, but a sociologist 25 years ago would go, duh. <laughs> it's like, yes, you need to study people differently. Organizational change is different. So, so that's the context about, about why you want to go to a conference. So in 1998, I went, I went to this conference. Uh, I wrote up these notes. Now, this is when the internet is starting off. And I, I hate to say that if the, if anyone that's not born in 1998 in this class, but anyway. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, th this is actually the original web pages. So, so the stability of the internet is very good. I'm very conscious about um, internet technologies and the ability of people to access them. So almost everything I've written ever is still accessible on the web from 1998. But this was the original stuff that got me started on it, and so I just wrote HTML pages. Uh, computer science students laugh at this, of course, because it's you know, so old. But um, <laughs> they're all there, and so from my notes, I went back to my own notes and said, why was this meeting so important for me? What is it I learned in 1998 that changed the way I thought about the world? So I have to go further back now, uh, and this is where it starts getting a little personal, because I was an IBM employee, I started at IBM in Canada in 1985, um, worked, in, uh, worked in headquarters planning and then did some retail industry market development work, and ended up in 1993, IBM changed from being a hardware company to being a services company. This is something that's now big history uh, with Lou Gerster coming in all sorts of IBM going down and then coming back up, and I was part of that. So I joined IBM at the point just when it was starting to go down. So. So for those of you who are, you're, uh, see too many young faces here, for people who think that there are only economies that grow, there are economies that crash. And so I've worked at a company, which is, I, I consider a good thing, which has gone down before and gone up. And then is, if you talk about IBM today, people would say, oh, IBM is so, you know, it's going through such hard times. Going, ah, we've been through hard times before. I've been down before and we came back up. And so IBM is going through another transformation. For those of you who want to buy stock, you might want to buy, if you had money to buy stock, you might actually buy IBM stock now because it's about 148, and when I sold my stock a couple of years ago, it was 200. So it's gone down a lot, and if you think the company's gonna be around another 100 years, you might buy the stock. Anyway, so in 2003, uh, IBM um, had this transformation, and uh, essentially the, the, uh, the challenge that IBM had was that it was a mainframe hardware company. Right? We're getting in, this is like pre-internet, we're not even at internet yet, right? And we're in the client-server era. And IBM is not doing very well, they bring in Luke Gerstner. Luke Gerstner was a management consultant, originally from American Express. And he, and he looks around IBM and he says, IBM has all these really smart people, but they have absolutely no skills relevant for today's world. <laughs> so what we're going to do is we're going to hire some consultants, and so they hired this guy named Bob, Hall, Bob um, Howe, and he started the consulting group inside of IBM. Um, and there is a, this IBM Systems Journal, uh, which has some very interesting articles. Um, there's one called Strategic Alignment, Leveraging Information Technology to Transform Organizations. And this was IT strategy. Essentially the idea is your IT strategy should align with your business strategy. Your business strategy could drive your IT, or your IT could drive your business. And the people that thought, never thought about IT driving business, this is 1993. Today, you look at a company like Uber, and you kind of go, oh, Uber wouldn't exist unless the internet goes. They go, yeah, in 1993, they would go, you can't have a company like Uber. Like, just impossible. Because IT does not drive business. So in 1993, that was a new idea. Um, and then the idea of business transformation, 
And business transformation, this article was about uh, transformation as opposed to re-engineering. So now we're really getting back to where we were born. Uh, there used to be uh, Michael Hammer, who had this book called Reengineering, uh, and it came, and that's where the, all the stuff started when they started the ideas of reengineering. But there was idea that reengineering did not actually get you to a next level. It just kind of redid things over, like Six Sigma sorts of things came out of that. Uh, so uh, when I was at IBM, I first trained in as an IT strategist. Uh, I did with generous at that point. I had like five weeks of training. It was really good. Um, and, uh, and through a number of circumstances, which I'll describe a little bit about, I didn't certify as a consultant. And so when I came back into Canada in 2001, I certified as a business transformation consultant. So that means, in effect, as, term, as at IBM, I am trained in all of the methodologies that IBM does. And so this is the background. And the system thinking is important here. Because what happens is that we're talking about organizational change with a company like IBM. Part of it is the technology. And the technologies consistently change. So you have the technological change, and you have the organizational change that's required. And, but both of them have to be done. So I've been coming to the technology company saying, we're going to redo all your systems. And then, and then it gets to the end, and the, uh, the people who are using the system, I can't use the system. I don't understand what it's doing. All those sort of things are typical. So IBM at that time, 1993, thought the way we need to do consulting is both the social systems and technological systems. Ah, how do you now study social systems and technological systems? Because they're both systems, but they're kind of like stuff that's going back and forth, and there's differences in social systems. So that was kind of the challenge, and we've worked our way through a lot of that. But from an IBM perspective, uh, you end up doing all of this. Um, I am what they call a business architect. That's the best description of what I do. Uh, a business architect, and this is a, a description from uh, the Open Group. So the Open Group is a technology body, and there's always been this fight within the in the uh, in the software community because enterprise architects are generally considered to be the ultimate. But enterprise architects say uh, I, I, they, they always have this kind of bad, or look, they, 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 they look at business architects really badly. And they go, there's no, difference between or, there's no difference between enterprise architecture and business architecture. And I go, okay, uh, let's, let's have that discussion. So what does the, what does the enterprise architecture do this does? Enterprise architecture, you know, engineers all of the way the information flows in the business. Great. So that means that you actually will go in and change all the technologies, the way information flows in the business? Yes. Do you do reorganizations? Do you do organization design of the people? No. Oh, well, I do that too. So inside of IBM and inside most technology companies, when you say you're a business architect, they go, oh, this guy's not a techie and this sort of stuff. No, no. I can do technology, but I also do social systems. So that's the context for um, 94 through to about 2000, 2006. Most of my time at IBM has been around business transformation and IT where there's been a requirement to understand social systems, understand technology systems, and also organizational change from a personal level because you're dealing with individuals. Okay, so, so that's around 94 I get into this. In, um, in around 1995, 1996, 97, there's uh, this idea of configurable, this, uh, well, what was called the IBM Global Services Method. Because now you're thinking about going into consulting. How do you actually do consulting on a worldwide level? And you have all these people. And, and um, if any of you have ever seen an IBM team get together, what happens is that an IBM team will show up at a client site. And I've had these comments about it. It's like, gee, you guys work so well together. You guys been working together like, you know, 10 years or something like that? I said, no, we met like 10 minutes ago. <laughs> and how is it you do that? And part of it comes back, well, part of it's culture, but the other part was that they have um, this idea of componentized development. And so they, had, they used a, what was called a work products-based method. The history of that came out of the object-oriented phase because we made the shift from uh, procedural programming to object-oriented programming and no one knew what objects were. There are all these gurus doing object orientation and in effect, IBM hired them all. But then what happened was you have three different methodologists coming in and saying, 
Oh, you need to do an object-oriented design. What's it look like? Well, you have these but you have these squares, and you have these circles, and you have these lines, and they mean this. And the next methodology says, well, yeah, kind of like that, but the squares and the circles, they're all different. Like, we use the circles as, as we use the squares, these squares. So you have to run across all these sorts of differences. So IBM created a work product space method which says, your customer doesn't care about whether you use boxes or circles. They want this output. And the complaint that was coming from customers was, okay, we bring in your technology people, and your technology people come in, and the first thing they say is, what's your business strategy? And they say, we just paid you half a million dollars three months ago, IBM. Wake up. We're not going to pay you again to do the same work over. And so there was this fo focus on methods at that time. Um, from that, I got involved in this project called Architects Workbench. And this is a research project. Um, and it was a tool to put all these components together. It's technology components primarily. Uh, my friend Ian Simmons, who, uh, who I'll cite, was also working on this sort of thing and knew about all these ideas about social systems, so we're trying to do this and put some of the ideas there. But the question is, can you create a tool whereby you would model the business enterprise, the people, the purposes, the organization, all these sorts of things, right? So that's kind of the domain, and it's a big job. Like, it's, it's, a, it's a real research project. Um, there's an article in the IBM Systems Journal about it, so, you know, it's, it's something significant. So. Uh, I got into leading a uh, first of a kind project for IBM, which was before the Architects Workbench. And what happened was that the way, and you know, these are politics and the way the things are funded inside of IBM, uh, the first of a kind project got killed. Um, and so I was uh, in 1997, a little bit adrift. And I had been having conversations with Steve Heckel. Uh, Steve Heckel is a really interesting guy. Um, he is, uh, he was, a, uh, his title was Director of Strategic Studies. He was in corporate planning at IBM. And so <coughs> we'd been having discussions with him um, because I, I, I was meeting him in conferences outside of IBM. The best way for IBMers to meet each other is not inside of IBM, but outside of IBM. And he was, uh, he was one of the chairmen, he was chairman for the Marketing Science Institute, things like that. So I was down in New York, uh, in, uh, in New York area. I'd go over and drop and see him. And so, Eventually what happened was that the, uh, when my first of a kind project that became Architects Workbench got killed, um, I was over at the Advanced Business Institute. The Advanced Business Institute wa is, was, the building is still there. Uh, it's in Palisades, New York. So if you, uh, you, what, you, what you do is you, you're in New Jersey and you're driving north and uh, you're on the west side of the Hudson River. The first hamlet that you hit is Palisades. So it's just inside the New York state border. Uh, it, the original idea for the Palisades facility and the Executive Business um, Institute was uh, by Thomas Watson, Jr., who was the person that shaped IBM. So now we're going back more into history. The reason that center exists was that Watson had this belief that the best customer is educated customer. And so we, we, this is where um, the, 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 way the, the way this works is someone is a vice president of finance in a corporation. We're in the age when the internet is not even anyone in the glimmer of anything. Like a Mac is a new thing, right? The, uh, the idea of a mouse is a new thing. Where does a vice president of finance go to learn to push a mouse when he becomes the CIO, the chief information officer for a company? Okay, so IBM had that. We would actually teach classes on how you use PCs because a PC was something that was new and you have the DOS prompt, you have the command, sort of, and you're an executive vice president of one of the largest world's corporations, and it's like, you just don't understand this stuff. So, so the center was founded, and Steve ended up in the center. And he was writing this book, which was called Adaptive Enterprise, Creating Sense of Response Organizations. Uh, Steve has articles in the Harvard Business Review, and, uh, and so we go over, and we'd have these conversations, uh, Ian and I would go over, and Doug McDavid, another guy that, uh, that, that's in the system community now, and we'd have these discussions, and one of the discussions was, what is the purpose of the enterprise? What is the purpose of a business enterprise? It's a classical sort of thing. Um, now, I'm actually an MBA in Kellogg School, so the classical answer for what a uh, business enterprise is for is an enterprise exists to make money. And Steve goes, wrong. I go, what do you mean? It's like, you know, I've been in you know, eight years, I've been six years of university, two years in the PhD program, so eight years of university, and I'm coming out and saying that 
the primary purpose of business enterprise is to make money because, you know, Milton Friedman and all the free market economies, all that stuff, that's, no. No, that's not the way it is at all. Making money is a constraint on the business. It is not the purpose of the business. The purpose of the business is to serve a social function. And so at this point, it's kind of like, uh, I don't understand what it is you're talking about. And, and so Steve, at this point, is writing the Adaptive Enterprise book. Uh, if you re it, it's a, a book that's worth reading. Uh, if you go to Book Finder, I think you can buy it for a dollar now because it's pretty old. Uh, and, uh, and there's actually a lot of discussion when the book came out that people wouldn't understand it. And, uh, the, and the reason people don't understand it is it has all the systems content baked into the system. So for those of you who are looking about, about companies, about or self-organization, how do, you, uh, how do you enable a company to do self-organization? And then how do you do that at a scale like IBM? That's the book. If you're trying to do this for you know, a 10-person enterprise, it may not be relevant. But Steve was in corporate planning at IBM his whole career. And he had this idea of empowerment. He had all these ideas. And this is a way that he prescribed to do it at IBM. That that's his background, more of his history, right? So, Steve had not yet written the book. This, uh, this is a Harvard Business Review, Harvard Business School book, uh, Harvard School Business School Press book, 1999. Um, and uh, he had not yet written the book. I was working on it. I was having some trouble working on it, but I said, okay. Well, um, so um, the promise at that time, Al Barnes said, um, David, uh, this is, I'm understanding how systems work. Uh, in IBM, I can't hire you, but, uh, which is what we call headcount. Um, but I have money, so I can bring you in from Canada to work in the U.S. on assignment. And so I did that for two years um, at Palisades. And so that was an opportunity for me to do business research at IBM using all the IBM mechanisms because they had money and it wasn't a permanent sort of thing and I have to go back to Canada in the end, but it was a great opportunity. So I came in to, uh, to this, and there's always this interesting perception set because uh, because I can do technology, although I don't do it. So Steve thought I was there to build the commitment management software, which is in one of the appendices for this book. But I was there and I was saying, I can't build this system to manage the business enterprise unless I understand what it is you're trying to do in the business. And so when frustration one day says, oh, you don't understand the system thinking, go read some Russ Acoff. Like, okay, so I start doing some reading. Uh, I go to a conference and stuff like that, and I, I, I go to, uh, to, to hear Ross Acoff speak. And, and Steve eventually works his way through the book and gets it done. And um, at, at one point, um, well, during development of the book, I remember standing in Steve's office, we're at the whiteboard, I'm doing the, the drawing sort of stuff, and he goes, Steve, Steve, you say this. Russ Acoff says this, which is different. And then Steve said, you don't understand. And they go, no, 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 and then try to explain to me. Um, and um, and so, in the end, he said, I told you to read Russ Acoff, not become Russ Acoff. <laughs> um, and, and Marianne Coe, a friend of mine, said that um, Steve would never have finished the book except for all of those discussions, arguments that we had, because he had to clarify the way he was thinking and expressing it. Because the thing I like about Russell Acoff, which I'll get to in a moment, is he is the most published author in systems thinking and He's very, very clear and easy to read. But do not mistake that for him being right. This is one of the challenges. So the standard protocol now, and I don't know how much Catry preserves this, was we build you up in systems thinking, you think you got it, and then we tear you down and say, everything you learned, let's think about that. Is it really right? Because that's the way system thinking works. First, for someone coming in, they need the very simplest ideas. Russ Acoff is very easy, very clear, and you get into the system's language, you get into the system's literature, and then someone comes and says, but he doesn't do anything about resilience. Well, yeah, Russ Acoff was not in an era of resilience. He doesn't say anything about the internet. Yeah, because he's older. He's, he's the older, this is old books. And so the world has changed, and that's the way that, that science progresses. But at this time, Steve Heckel tells me to go read Russ Acoff. Okay, so we have Russ Acoff. 
uh, this was an article, so Russ Acoff passed away a few years ago, and I started reading The Democratic Corporation, which I think is 1994. Uh, end up with the whole library. Uh, so, um, Creating the Corporate Future is 1981. The Art of Problem Solving is fun. Um, he has what he calls Acoff's Fables. And um, this, there are different ways of approaching the same, um, the same idea. Uh, my friend David Hawk says that Russ Acoff wrote the same book 20 times. Um, that's why it's the most published author around. And each book has a different variation, but again, again you'd understand the context for him. He did his PhD dissertation on what's called on purposeful systems. And so his focus is on purpose. Uh, and other systems do not focus on purpose. But uh, he wrote on purposeful systems, and very few people read it. It's not. It's a very technical work. I had read it. Um, I, I went. So one of the, one of the just again showing. I go to conferences where I'm not supposed to be. Uh, in 1999, you'll you'll actually find a paper that I wrote where I describe um, working with Steve Heckel and work and and trying to understand Russ Acoff. And so I went to an Acoff conference in 1999, celebrating his 80th birthday, 60th birthday, 60. I can't remember. Going with the, anyway, um, it was a significant birthday. And then I get to the conference, and I discover that I'm the only person at this conference who didn't study directly under Russ Acoff. It was not supposed to be a conference open to everybody, but I showed up. You know, they welcomed me, nice guy, you know, so it's fine. And so I ended up at this conference. Um, and one of the compliments I got was when I was doing a presentation, someone came up and they said, we didn't think that unless you studied under Russ Acoff, you could read on purposeful systems and understand it. But you've actually read the book and you understood it, which is like, oh, great. That's a nice compliment for me. It was also one of the, co the conference where I first officially met um, my friend David Hawk, who's the link back here to Finland. Um, and David and I, we didn't actually meet in that conference, didn't meet until the, the next conference, but he and I were sitting together, they, we had a breakout group, 10 people in a group, and for some reason, I was sitting beside David Hawk, and the two of us are arguing against everyone else at the table. Like, we're really, like, we're defending ourselves. We're kind of going, why is this guy on my side? Because we're having an argument, and so we, we just kind of thought the same way. We had the same appreciation for systems, and even people within the ACOF community that studied under them had this different opinion, a different way of looking at the system. Because we, we are not, this is one thing that ACOF says, is that when you are looking at learning, uh, one of the things that arises is, is disciples. So a disciple is someone who takes the content from the master and then continues that work, right? But in a systems, perspective, you do not want disciples. You actually want people who differ from you and will argue with you. And he tells a story about uh, a professor who was a math professor who um, was near Nobel class and he was retiring and uh, his students all got together. So what did the students give him? The students got together and wrote a research paper that showed his PhD was wrong. <laughs> that was the ultimate gift to the professor. The professor said, thank you. And that shows what disciplinary knowledge and, and disciples and all this stuff is about. You want people to learn more than you could ever learn yourself. You want them to surpass you. So, um, Acoff, um, you, you, you end up with a lot of articles. If you just search on Russ Acoff on Google, you'll find a lot. Sort of thing, the first fundamental principle of system thinking is that management should be directed to the interaction of the parts and not the actions of the part taken separately. Kathy will come back tomorrow. <laughs> or get around some of it, right? Um, so the, the, the ideas here around parts and holes, um, and so um, it takes a while to get through them, but that's where I started. So in 1998, early, I went to a conference in Boston where Russ was lecturing. This is when you have the acetate slide projectors, and he's writing on the slides and this sort of stuff. That was a style. And you know, charming old guy, you kind of go, this is interesting. Um, but uh, uh, um, from there, uh, I ended up at the 1998 ISSS meeting, who was organized by Jay Swanson, this has passed away, because ACOF was on the program. And so I saw ACOF speak once, it's like, okay, this is a really good idea, so I go to the conference, ACOF speaks there again. Um, but I started learning, um, and this is Jay Swanson, this is a guy who saw me taking notes. Um, the things that you don't understand is that uh, this, the ISSS is now a pretty stable organization, it's pretty reorganized, um, and, uh, and it's in you know 56, 57th annual meeting of the International Society of System Sciences. Um, what I didn't know at that time 
was that <laughs> the organization had practically collapsed before the 1998 meeting. The company, the, this is a, a society that was going to go down. It was, there was a lot of fighting in there. They had uh, had a meeting in Korea that people didn't attend. Uh, funding was down, all sort of stuff. And so GA is the person that brought back the ISSS. He thought that systems were important and that we should continue this work and we should keep, the, keep this community together. Now, if you ever go to ISSS meeting, next year it's in July in Colorado. I, attend, I encourage you to go. Uh, it's an interesting experience. It is a, uh, a conference where there are so many different ideas, and um, the purpose of the conference is, the best purpose for the conference is if you're working on a paper, and you don't yet have it done. Because if you're working on systems content, where are you gonna get advice? Right. You're actually pretty fortunate here in, in the Helsinki area. You have people that, can, you know, that have been around this a while now. You can actually get some coaching. Uh, but you go to the ISSS meeting and you get to work with Russ Acoff. You can just go ask him. He's there and you can spend, and he'll explain it to you. And he understands that you don't know everything and they're very good about these sorts of things. So um, next year the meeting is in Colorado. Um, talk to Catherine about how you might or might not get funding to go. What you want to do is you want to submit an abstract. There are, the, the, fin is, the Finns have ways of doing things. I've discovered this. I don't understand them. People show up and they somehow they have funding. So anyway. <laughs> For travel funding. You can apply for travel funding, there's enough time to do that. Um, the, um, uh, the way the papers get accepted is on the abstract. You write an abstract, they review it, they actually figure out that you're not a wonk somewhere, not a crazy person, you actually are doing something related to systems, they accept that, you write the paper before or after, but there is a proceedings, so if you are looking to get published work done that is leading edge, then this is a good place to go because you end up with conference proceedings. And uh, it's lightly reviewed, so it's not like the heavy A journals. So this is a problem with academia, is that academics all want to publish in the A journals, in these top tier journals. Well, how do you publish in a top tier journal? Well, actually, to publish in a top tier journal, it's a very rational, linear sort of thing. They don't like new ideas. They want very old ideas. They want stuff that's proven. If you're on the leading edge, to publish, you need to publish in a B or a C journal. And you need to publish somewhere else, you need to have someone, you need to have a community that says, this is good work. Now it may have some flaws, but that's what publishing is about, right? So if you're gonna do stuff, if you're working on your thesis and you have enough time to get review and you want some review on some technical part of your thesis, submit as a paper to this conference and then go talk to the world's expert in system dynamics, the world expert in anticipatory systems. All these sort of people show up at this conference. It's a pretty great community. So I come to this conference, and this is the sort of thing that the uh, attitude you get. And so uh, he talks about uh, interviewing Margaret Mead. So Margaret Mead is a, a significant anthropologist. She was one of the people at the beginning of the society, and she was the president of the society at one point. And you're talking about um, the idea about feedback, and, um, and you know, who owns this idea? Who owns this idea? Who did it come from? And what GA said was that Margaret Mead says, it was in the air. People are just talking about it. You don't take credit for things. It's not important necessarily who had the idea. But some breakthrough ideas come through the interaction of people, which is why I come to Finland and I interact with people here because I get new ideas, right? Um, so then eventually someone publishes it and they become the person that, you know, was the person who published the idea. But the development of ideas is an a, is a interesting process of interaction of people. So the ISSS meeting is that sort of place where you get that interaction. So I'm going to go through now some of the content from the meeting and what I got in 1998. And some of this takes a while to figure out. Um, the first idea that came from Russell Acoff was the idea of synthesis precedes analysis. When you ask the question, what is systems thinking? You have synthesis precedes analysis. Synthesis is putting things together. Analysis is taking things apart. So what this says is before you take things apart, you want to put things together. Okay, well, how does that work? Okay. So, Russ Acoff says, identify a containing whole system, which is a thing to be explained as a part. So my favorite example of this is uh, people like to complain about their transit system. So in Toronto, um, we always complain about our transit system because it's always full, you know, sort of stuff. And so, if you were to take the system apart, how would you complain about this thing? What would you say? Well, 
the drivers are unresponsive, the, ma the machinery is old, you know, they're not doing their jobs, uh, you know, those sort of things. That is taking things apart. So it doesn't really help you if you get on a streetcar, tram, bus in the morning and are uncivil to the driver. The driver can't do anything about most of the things that happen in his life. He's, his job is to drive the bus or do, that's, that's his part. <coughs> the transit system is part of a larger system part of multiple larger systems. So it's part of, in Toronto, it's part of the city of Toronto. It's part of the province of Ontario. It's part of a financial system. It's part of a labor system. So if you want to understand why the uh, bus driver or the tram driver behaves the way it is, it's because there are union rules and there are employment rules, right? So all these things layer on top. So if you want to understand the system and understand what's happening on that tram or that bus, don't go looking inside the bus. Look outside. So that's the first thing. Identify the containing whole system of which the thing to be explained is a part. Second, explain the behavior property of the containing whole. So why is the bus driver uh, behaving this way? And then explain the behavior properties of things to be explained in terms of the role or functions within the containing whole. So this is now trying to put it all back together. Now, for those of you who are in the class tomorrow and are taking this as a thinking class, you are going to get to the point, and I've now validated this, when, when the people come to, the, 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 the question I always have is, um, if these people take the two system thinking classes at Alto, the Great Sustainability Program, and they come to an ISSS meeting, are they going to be embarrassed? And my answer is, you will not be embarrassed. You will learn all the language that you will need to go in there, and you kind of go, oh yeah, I heard that before, I've heard that before, I've heard that before, and that makes me think about this. And that's generally what happens at the system meeting. So two of the words that you'll hear are synthesis and analysis. And th that's the most important part for me, the number one thing that I learned in the ISSS meeting in 1998. Synthesis and analysis are two ideas that are basic <coughs> to systems, and when you meet, you're going to meet people who say, oh yeah, I'm a systems thinker. And then you go, you're, you're at a cocktail party. Oh, you're a system thinker, you're a president. I'm a system thinker too. So I've been to all these parties. And I'm there, and I'm listening to this person tell me about what their system thinking thing is about. And I go, wow, this guy is really a bad system thinker. He doesn't understand systems at all. And it happens more often than you think. That most, uh, uh, maybe a third of the people that I, I talk to, they don't really understand systems, even though they say they're system thinkers. And the primary reason is because the problem of synthesis versus analysis. The ones that are most challenged on this, um, I, I work a lot with uh, across organizations, so we have a relationship between ISSS and ECOSI, the International Council on Systems Engineering. So systems engineering in the scheme of engineering as a whole discipline is a really small part. And people end up in system engineering for re different reasons. But you would think that systems engineers should understand systems, which they don't necessarily. Because their job is often to take parts and put them together, and they may or may not get a choice about how those parts are chosen or those sort of things, right? If a systems engineering project is done right, you start off, and the systems engineer says, I'm trying to do some synthesis. I'm trying to build something and put something together. Now let me make this relevant for you. I'm gonna bring this right up to date. Design thinking. The newest you know, buzzword in the last five years, design thinking. I'm a design thinker. Now, for those of you who are trained in de as designers, I know that when you are designers and you go and you talk something, I'm a design thinker, and you go, no, he isn't. Doesn't understand design at all, right? Doesn't understand design. And a lot of that is because design has evolved as a field at the same time as systems. And so I do like, you, you can find a lot of people, uh, there's actually a new community called Relating System Thinking and Design. Um, uh, and for those of you who want to come to Toronto next October, I think that's where the conference is going to be. Um, uh, Tim Brown, I think, actually understands systems. What he says is that design thinking, you have these two ideas of diverging and converging, which is creating choices and making choices. And people focus very much on this part, Specifically, if you're in an MBA class and try to teach design thinking. I, I was a guest last night. My, my son is, is taking an undergraduate program in business and technology. And uh, he's in a workshop yesterday, and he has this thing that 
and it has a workbook that's a design thinking, a workbook. And I think, we're going to have a conversation when I get home, right? Because I don't know if they do or don't understand design thinking. But this is only one axis of diverge and converge. There is synthesis and analysis, diverge and converge. So if you are a designer, this is the thing I like about designers. Designers are trained from the beginning to do synthesis. You're always trying to create a whole. When you're creating a product, when you're creating a service, you are trained to do that, but you don't know why. It kind of comes into it. Like you can't really explain what it is you're doing. And so what, what we'll do in the system thinking courses that, you, that you're taking with Katri is give you the language so you can actually say, this is what I do. If you are a designer, you can now say, well, what does the designers do? They synthesize stuff, they put things together. Yes, that's what designers do. If you don't have a whole, if you don't have a product when you're done, you're a bad designer. Right? You, have a, you, you, you put things together. There are other skills you learn, but they're, they're involved together. Synthesis is hard, because we're trying to put things together, which is always intention. Right? Okay. Second thing I learned from Russ Akoff, uh, and this gets published as a paper uh, with Jamshid um, Garajadagi, who is one of his colleagues. And it was called Reflection on System as Models. And this is a refinement. Uh, this, this was published in 1996. It takes a while for ideas to get through. But it's a refinement of the ideas of social systems and ecological systems. Here's a summary. OK, I talked about systems. Um, I skipped the slide where I normally talk about systems. My definition, the David Ng definition of, a, of system thinking. Systems thinking is a perspective on parts, wholes, and their relations. Okay. So systems thinking is a perspective. So when I say perspective, it's not the only perspective or only way of looking at things. One perspective on parts, wholes, and their relations. And when I say relations, that will mean that there are part-part relations, there are part-whole relations, and there are also whole-whole relations. I see some people, eyes turning up in your head between your thinking, which is good. Uh, I'll be around for, this, for the <coughs> class tomorrow, so we can talk about that tomorrow. Um, I mean, just to get through this talk today, we are going to talk about um, parts and wholes. Okay, so there are four types of systems. There are deterministic systems. They don't have purpose in the parts, they have purpose in the wholes. So an engine in a car, an engine is a part in a car. The engine doesn't choose to be an engine. The car doesn't choose to be a car. It's a machine. It's deterministic. Okay. So this is a machine. The second one is animated system. You have parts and you have holes. The parts are not purposeful. Your heart does not choose to be a heart. However, you as an individual can be animated. You can move. So. Anyone that doesn't like sitting in their seat, you can get up, move somewhere else, right? And so there's an interesting fine point here, which is why does he call it animated system, not biological system, stuff like that? You end up with this debate, do trees have purpose? Well, a, a tree doesn't actually chew, a tree can't move. So in, in Akoff definition, a tree is not a purposeful system. But it's, it's very important for us. It gives us air. So it's like a key Okay, key now you're talking about an air, but okay. So now I got you thinking, right? I said Russ Akoff is very clear. I didn't say he was correct. <laughs> okay, so let's save that discussion for tomorrow. Because that, that's very important. This is what happens. So, and then, so Russ Akoff says, your heart doesn't have choice, but you as a human being have choice. We have social systems. Social systems are purposeful in the part as a whole. So we as individuals have choice within a social system, and we as a group have a choice of social system. So we as a group, we can all decide that the room is too warm, we want to move to another room. We as a, uh, a school could decide that we want to do something different. We as a nation could decide we want to do something different. We as a world could decide we want to do something different. That's how social system thinks. The parts can have purpose, so we are individuals, and the whole can have purpose, which is all of us. Then we have ecological systems. Ecological systems have purposes in the parts, but not in the whole. So this is why we have a problem in climate change. Because we can change 
our individual behavior, we as, in, as groups, as social groups, we can have purpose and say, as a school, as a nation, we can change things. But you run into the problem that we cannot change the weather. We cannot change the whole world. Because it depends how you draw the boundaries. And, and if you try to change the world, that's a pretty big system to try to change. So purposeful on the parts, not purposeful on the whole. I can stop my lecture right now because you guys have been thinking about this for a while, right? <laughs> can you say, I can't really understand the difference, the goal-seeking and ideal-seeking, ah, okay. purposeful and purposeful. That's okay, this, this is a refinement, and this is, um, this is again, a, a debating point. So, Akoff has uh, time, thinks about time. And, and so, the way you think about purpose, traditionally, you go to the branch of philosophy called teleology, Teleology is a study of ends, mm -hmm. right? And so ideals are timeless. There is a such thing as ultimate beauty, um, ultimate okay. justice, ultimate right, ultimate wrong. And what Akoff does, and does it in a business environment, but he does it, can do it also in other social contexts, which is a, and when you are goal seeking, you can share an end for a certain period of time. So. For, for within one year, if we're planning a business, you set a, a goal for one year. And it could be that you, you, you end up in these situations where you decide that you're gonna share a goal, maybe for the wrong reasons. So all of us have been in situations where it's like, okay, you know, we, there's a group of people or a society or someone you wanna help, they go, come help us. And you go, okay, you know, I can help you, but I'm not in this for the long term, right? I'll help you for like next month or the next year or something like that, but I'm not gonna dedicate my life to you. So, you know, I worked at IBM, and so I was a good IBM employee. They appreciate me as an employee. It's not my life. I don't work there anymore. So, in terms of ideals, you know, is it an ideal career? Well, no, I can't idealize my career. Now, this is where you get into discussion about ACOF being clear, but that creates the debate now. Because ACOF believed that we could be ideal seeking. Now, we may not attain the ideal, but we could actually, as a group of people, share an ideal. Emery, because, uh, so Akoff wrote his uh, PhD dissertation on purposeful systems with, uh, he wrote his PhD dissertation and republished it as on purposeful systems, which is written by Akoff and Emery. Emery did not believe that we can be ideal seeking together. He believed that we were goal seeking, so it's okay for us to be in a temporary situation where we decide we're gonna pursue one end together, but in the longer term, we're going to break apart. And that makes all the difference in the way you understand the world, about whether you're ideal seeking or only goal seeking. That's a really fine point in the system. Yeah, this links very strongly to the co uh, communicative uh, planning theory where Habermas yes. has been yes. uh, talk about the ideal and uh, ideal yes. speech act, yes. as yes. he yeah. says it. And, and, or do we, do we understand, for example, planning? Uh, as an interest-based, uh, yes. so is this per, uh, goal seeking more? Yeah, and yeah. Habermas and is this ideal seeking? Yeah, yeah. So it's very, I mean, oh yeah, yeah, in yeah. line with uh, that philosophy. Yeah, yeah. This is definitely a philosophical discussion yeah. when you get into it, and 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 almost and, and a lot of the system stuff you end up with that, and then the question is, can you take it from philosophy down into a science? Because otherwise you end up with it totally, you know, you, 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 uh, it, it gets to be a little abstract. So sometimes yeah. it's science. It, Sometimes you can do science, sometimes you can't, right? This is one of the issues. Okay, so how is this relevant? Um, we, today, more recently, have been talking about systems of systems. And when I was at IBM, they had this chart, which is, um, there are the $54 trillion systems of systems. And so we have infrastructure, electricity, transportation. But this idea of systems of systems comes out. Now you have to stop and ask yourself, what do they mean by a system of systems? Why is it a system of systems as opposed to a system? And you're gonna get into the definition, well, what do I mean by system? And how do I draw the boundary? But I talked about parts and holes before. Does a system of system mean interaction between holes? Or does it mean interaction of perspectives of those holes? In either case, what happens is you end up with what Akoff calls a problematique, which is a system of problems. So there's one thing to have a problem, but there's another to have a system of problems. 
And when you work on a problem, when you fix one problem, you always end up causing another problem, right? So it's a system of problems. And, and can you create a system of systems? And are they complicated? Are they complex? These sort of things. These are sort of things that they work out in the systems community. But the idea originally comes from the idea of different types of systems. All that's based on 1998 meeting that I went to. Uh, IBM is looking for challenges. It's a $4 billion challenge. So healthcare is a big challenge. Building government infrastructure. And so these are big challenges, right? Where do you define a system? How do you change these sort of things? Okay. Another one, um, and this is one that I touched on in 2010 very, very lightly, um, but it's actually been brewing in the back of my mind. Um, this, this is related, um, so, so you need to appreciate that, uh, now you understand my background, why I was studying system thinking in the first place. I'm not really an ecologist. Um, I come from a business background, I come from social systems, I come from technology, um, and so the ideas uh, that I do in ecology and resilience are mostly because they're learned that way and I shape them with the other things I've learned. But one of the speakers that, that was there who's uh, influential is Howard Odom. Howard Odom was a uh, ecologist. He's actually one of the original ecologists. And he has this book, um, which was published around the time that he died. I think he died in 2002, 2003. And this is around 2001. Called A Prosperous Way Down. Um, if you're looking for something to read that may provoke you, you can find the blog. There's actually a blog also a prosperous way down. You'll run into the question about growth economies. Is growth a good thing? What happens when you're always pro-growth? Right? People don't think about what happens after growth. Could we design a society where it's not oriented towards growth? If you're not oriented towards growth, you're not just going to plateau. You're actually going to go down in some way. So it's anti-growth. And what would it mean to be anti-growth? And could you do that in a way that it doesn't hurt so much? Is there a prosperous way down? So one of the ways that I've thought about systems, and, and if you think about it in terms of businesses, is that every business starts off you know, kind of garage shop oriented, you know, and then it grows, it gets really huge. But then people go, oh, this company, like IBM, should always be a growth company. It should always be bigger and bigger. It's like, no. Growth is not always good. When you grow, it's something, certain things happen. So one of the, the claims I make that people think is a little heretical is, what is the best way for IBM to achieve profitability? The best way to achieve, for IBM to achieve profitability is to shrink. And why would that be? So most of you study economics enough to know that demand is a downward sloping curve, right? So for every additional product that you sell in economics, every additional product you sell, it has to go cheaper, right? To get a bigger market, you have to go cheaper and cheaper. So how is it that you would actually you know, make it so that you'd be more sustainable? Well, the, the bad word for this, people don't like the word monopoly, right? You restrict output and you reduce it and you go up the demand curve. If you're gonna go down and you're gonna do that, you're actually reducing supply. So the best way to be profitable is to shrink, not to grow. And, and people who followed IBM over the past couple of years who still don't understand, it's like, ooh, IBM is you know, getting smaller and smaller. I wrote a blog post about this. I got picked up a little bit in the, in the press because I asked, what's the optimal size for IBM in terms of employees? How many employees should IBM have? Because, uh, and I looked at the history because I can go back to 1985 when I joined the company and we have to go before that. Um, in the last couple of years, IBM has had around 420,000 employees worldwide. What is the smallest that IBM has ever been? In, in recent history, 250,000 employees. You're trying to change an organization, and you want and a big organization is harder to change, so you want a smaller organization. So my theory is that IBM should shrink. If it's going to change direction, you have to shrink. Now, there are different ways of doing that. You could lay off people which they've done somewhat recently, or you could retrain people, you've got all sorts of arguments how they do it. But fundamentally, you run into the issue of if a company's too big, you need to shrink. So uh, I thought that you know, maybe 300, 325, 350,000, if you look at kind of the history at IBM, I've blogged about it, that, that's what the size of the company should be. But that's based fundamentally off this idea of a prosperous way down. Is it better to have a huge company or a huge society where everyone's miserable, or have a smaller one where people are actually profitable. And, and this doesn't mean you couldn't spin off divisions. So 
If you look at IBM, when they spun off PC division, IBM could never make money at personal computers. So it spun it off, Lenovo bought the whole company, a whole bunch of employees went from IBM to Lenovo, and it helped the company. It helped Lenovo too, because Lenovo is core to their business now. But that's a different way of thinking, and it's related to some of this idea of a prosperous way down. Yeah, then the crucial question is what is the system? Is the system IBM? Yes, or exactly. Now you get into, that? yes, now you get what is the system? System boundary comes up mm -hmm. really quickly on all these things. Okay, um, the fundamental idea that Odom has is um, on energy, embodied energy. So in this world today, we have products and we have services. So a product, uh, a service is something that you, you get at a period of time and you don't get a physical ownership of it. So for example, if we, go, if we go to computing, people are doing cloud computing now. You don't buy a computer anymore, you buy web space somewhere. Someone else has to run the machines, they run as a utility, right? So the question would be, is it better to have a service or have a product? Because if you have a product, you make it once and then it's physically there. So many of you may have old computers, you probably all have old mobile phones for sure. Uh, there is an amount of energy that's required to build that product. How much do you want to put into the product? How much do you want to put in as a service? And now you get into deciding, well, you know, could you design a minimal hardware and then add lots of software to it that would change over time? Or do you want to have a product with a lot of functionality with it? And all that has to do with embodied energy. And the energy is, uh, you, you think about this, material, energy, information the three things that they have in systems. This is down now to basic basic systems ideas. Material, energy, information. Could you actually take some of the, uh, of the energy that's required, like software, and make your software bigger and make your hardware smaller? Or do you want the hardware bigger? And these sort of trade-offs you make when you're talking about, uh, about trying to design um, these sorts of things. And you end up with all these really funny diagrams there's a whole notation around this, which I don't do because I'm not an engineer. If you are an engineer, and there are engineers in this, this program, uh, it could be something you pursue because they have the idea about how you get economic use and all sorts of things that, that fit together. So this is an area that I've not studied very much, and it explains a little bit of the reason why this summer I went to the International Society for Industrial Ecology. This is industrial ecology. How many of you have heard of industrial ecology before? <laughs> okay, you're doing well then. Because this, uh, by this spring, I didn't know what industrial ecology was. I had no idea what industrial ecology was. And so uh, when I was doing my research, I ended up uh, founding a 2002 book that was uh, a book, and I blogged about this one, uh, it, it's a book called Construction Ecology. It, it was three parts of the book. The first one was ecologists including Howard Odom, including Tim Allen we'll talk about, including Gary Peterson, who's now at the Stockholm Resilience Center, um, and James Kay, who was at the University of Waterloo, who was uh, doing thermodynamics work. So I, I read this, and I go, okay, then that's the first part. The second part was they had architects. They had um, Sim van der Rijn, in the, in, uh, I think that's how I pronounce it. I don't know how pronounce the name, but I'm not an architect. They had, the, and the third one was they had people that were dealing in industry. But it was like I found this book, and I was just doing my usual sort of research, and I discovered this book, called, and, and um, John Ehrenfeldt was the managing director for this. He's now retired, but he started this field and worked on industrial ecology. So they had this conference, and uh, they had this theme called Taking Stock of Industrial Ecology. There's an e-book available. Um, the, this is an open e-book. It is not yet published, but by December, January, the whole proceedings for the conference um, are there, so you can actually, through the university, you can go and you can read the book. It's about 25 years of industrial ecology, where they take these ideas of materials and energy, not so much information, but you can argue about that, and they put those things together. And so again, it's like, this is on three weeks notice, I, this is in uh, July. In June, it's like, oh my god, I can go to this conference because I know nothing about industrial ecology. <coughs> so I decided to go and had a good time. Uh, you don't have to go uh, because uh, the plenary talk videos are all available. So I, I, I posted, uh, you, you can search on this, but the YouTube videos are all there. They're very short. Uh, they're enough to give you an introduction on it. Um, so that if you want to know what industrial ecology is, they tell you about it. Um, 
So um, that's that's how the arc, and I'm not finished on this arc yet. So in uh, in Toronto, when I get back, we have a group there called System Thinking Ontario. It turns out that uh, where is he? Chris Kennedy. Um, Chris Kennedy is doing work on urban metabolism, which is really good work. And and so. I, I got to meet Tim. I met Tim, you know, he's at the University of Toronto. This is another one of those places where it's like, to meet people from Toronto, I have to go to um, Surrey in the UK. Um, so I, I met Chris and I asked him, uh, in, you know, is he, uh, are, are there people doing industrial ecology work in Toronto? And talking to him, and I get the answer, well, not really, just him and some other few researchers at the University of Toronto. But then you hear his talk, why isn't he doing it there? It's because he's doing a study of 21 cities around the world funded by the OECD. So this guy's on a plane so much, we're lucky to have him in Toronto at all. <laughs> um, but we're having him come and give a, a, an introductory baby level talk about industrial ecology in Toronto, because we're just down the street from him um, at OCAD. And uh, I'm hoping to get him next year in Toronto to talk about the urban, urban metabolism stuff he's doing, because that's active research he's doing. But the idea of urban metabolism now takes the ideas of materials and energy and those sorts of things. And one of the things that, um, Chris was talking about in not in the plenary session, but in some of the side sessions, was talking about planning in China. Uh, and so the question comes um, in the development of railroads. Because if you have railroads, to put down rail, you need steel. And if you have steel, then you need coal. Because that's the way they generate it. But it turns out that the way that uh, they don't have coal in the right place, so you need trains to transport the coal. How much of the energy of mining coal is towards creating the steel, towards creating the train, which is a self-fulfilling mm -hmm. loop, right? Mm -hmm. And so if you had an electrical society, you know, could you get rid of all of the trains? Like th that would mean you don't put rail down. And that's a really interesting big question. Uh, I'm really looking forward to, to uh, Chris's work on that. That's a really interesting question. Um, Timothy Allen gave you this idea about complexity and complicatedness. Now, I'm not sure how much I'm going to be able to cover on this right now, because when I, when I taught the uh, system thinking classes, what I told people was, you're going to really want to read Tim Allen, but this, you, you guys are in a creative sustainability program, you have other things you're going to study, you may not have time to cover this while you're in the course. But um, I've claimed before that um, uh, Tim is the greatest living ecologist today. Uh, he's, he knows all the people, is connected with the Resilience Alliance, all these sorts of things. He's a botanist at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. For any of you who happen to be near Wisconsin, he loves visitors. Uh, Deanna and I were driving by, we stopped and, and we visited uh, uh, Tim. And he's welcome, to, he's happy to discuss ideas with you because now he's emeritus, he's retired. He doesn't travel so much anymore, he's getting a little bit older. <coughs> Um, but there's an idea of complicatedness and complexity that is fundamental systems that most people don't really understand. And I went to the 1998 meeting, and he actually published a supply side sustainability work in around, uh, this is 1999, and then there's more work when his book comes out in 2003, and I didn't figure it out till like 2005, 2006, uh, because it takes a little while for these ideas to, to get through. But here's the idea is um, you, may, you need to have a distinction between complexity and complicatedness. And so when we talk about complexity, complexity tends to be oriented around a hierarchy with, that, uh, with height, and complicatedness is around a flat hierarchy. Let me give you the analogy for this. Water is a complex system. There's a property of wetness that is associated with water. If you want to understand the property of wetness in water, you do not look at hydrogen and oxygen. Wetness is a property of the complexity when you put things together. So water has properties, hydrogen has proper properties, oxygen has pro properties. Okay. Another way of describing this, or another example of this, is if you think about, again I work from IT, I uh, work about computers. So you, have, you could have one big computer, a mainframe computer. Or you could have a network of PCs and servers around the world called the internet. So which do you want? Do you want a one mainframe computer or do you want little computers all networked together? 
And this is what I am calling, and now Ad, uh, Alan's permission, Tim Allen's permission, I'm calling this Allen's Dilemma. A mainframe computer is more efficient because a mainframe, you only require a few programmers. They can optimize on the power usage and it serves the world. So as one of the examples, eBay discovered this. So eBay was founded as a company. It started growing and it got bigger and bigger, but it used to work on you know, typical Linux-based servers and they migrated to IBM mainframes. No one talks about it very much, but why would you do that? It's like eBay is a big company, right? That's huge. And in order to process the amount of, of, of um, transactions they need to do, they moved into mainframe technologies, which most people go, well, oh, people don't use mainframes anymore. No, they're really efficient. You need a few smart people. Now you can have multiple mainframes, right? Because you can have a mainframe or you can have 100 servers. And if you have 100 servers, now you've got you know, all the connections, all sort of stuff. And that's, that's one way of designing it. So a mainframe is more efficient. However, if you look at Google and the way that Google organizes, Google has decided that the way that they do business is that they buy cheapest servers and they assume they're going to fail. So if you, if you read some of the books on Google, you see the strategy where Google actually builds their own computers. They're in effect one of the world's largest computer manufacturers. They don't sell anybody. But what they do is they buy the cheapest parts uh, and they know that things are going to fail and so they, de they design software so that one server fails, it picks up somewhere else. But what that means is that you actually have two servers, or three or 10, or whatever, make, make, make it redundant, that are all running at the same time. They all consume more power. So you have a complex system, like a mainframe, or you could have a complicated system, like Google, and that's a decision. It's not that one is better than the other. You just decide that here are the resources. So if you can't find, enough, if you have a problem finding enough smart people to run your computers, get a mainframe. It requires fewer smart people. You can hire, you know, so you, you, you pay 10 people half a million dollars to run this as opposed to, you know, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people, right? But it's a decision you make. Now, the trade-off is between, and here's where the dilemma comes in, is that a complex system is more efficient, but a complicated system is more sustainable. And why is a complex system more sustainable? Because if one part fails, there's other parts around that can take up the slack. If they're organized that way, if you design the system that way. So when Google designs their system, they're designing a really complicated system because you know, half of uh, you know, ten percent of the Google's network could go down, and the world would never know because other places in the world pick it up. They go, it's a, you know, a little bit slower because here you are in Helsinki and used to having the servers going to the UK, and all of a sudden the server your query is going to Japan and comes back to Japan, or it goes to Toronto and comes back to Toronto. That's a complicated system. That's sustainable, but it takes more resources because you have the redundancy built in. Redundancy is not a bad thing. Uh, there's theories about redundancy of function or redundancy of parts, these sorts of things that come out of Emory and, you'll, and that you get into the readings in systems theory. So that sort of thing exists. But this is a fundamental idea that came out of 1998. It's taken a while to unwrap. Now, moving up, uh, Tim, although he's retired, is not yet um, passed on, so he's still got his knowledge. And in 2013, 2014, uh, 2014 He's written about hierarchy theory, which is actually um, his, his field, what he calls hierarchy theory. And I haven't actually gone through this yet, but if I was in this class, teaching this class, uh, he talks about how the Holly panarchy fits with Howard Odom's work. Now, this takes a long time. Right? I saw Odom in 1998, and this guy published an article in 2014, putting the two of them together, and he's actually saying that the panarchy stuff is not a model. He's saying that this is a model, and if you actually want to do real modeling work, you have to do it with Odin stuff, not with Holland's work. It's a good metaphor, but it only, a metaphor can only get you so far. I can recommend, I have not yet read, but I'm going to read, um, Towards Unified Ecology has just been published. It is a, get the second volume. He rewrote the whole book, and um, this, the, the book he's known for is Toward Unified Ecology. But 
this one is like a 500 page book. <laughs> and there's still stuff that um, I'm finding in it. So uh, the, one of the reasons I went to the, um, to the um, Surrey meeting, to the industrial ecology meeting, was because Tim Allen in, in 2002 published something I hadn't seen. He, in one of the books that he, what he's known for, he has a book called Supply Side Sustainability. In the 2002 article, he talks about, well, there's actually supply side sustainability and demand side sustainability. And it's like, demand side sustainability, what is that? I don't even know what that is, which is why I went to see Tim. Um, and then we started having a discussion, which is that, in effect, he's been working through these ideas. And he said, well, if you know, David, if you want to publish on this, go ahead. And it's like, we're having this discussion. But that's when I was like, I need to finish my PhD dissertation first. <laughs> so something you may see me working on later is demand side sustainability. Because it's not just supply side sustainability. I don't know what it is. And Tim's been working on it for a while. And he said, it's like on page 393 of his book. So he, has it, he actually has it because it's not in the original first edition of the book. So now I have to read his book so I can do the research, da da da, all sort of stuff. So it's a long arc on the history of science here. Uh, Tim has created, this is, a, this is actually a hidden thing, I have to ask him why it is, so you, you probably have to type this one in, but he actually starts, um, he's been doing a video series lecture because he can do them at home. Uh, and he's trying to step through, uh, this is the first in the series, I hope he does more, but in fact he's doing video lecturing uh, about ecology and the way he looks at the world. So uh, I hope to see more of these. One more idea, um, 1998, Deborah Hammond, Deborah Hammond uh, was a president of the uh, ISSS in 2006, and I met her in 1998 as a grad student. And she was doing her PhD dissertation, and the history was that she was looking for uh, a, a dissertation, and she ran into Wes Churchman, who's one of the big figures in the system sciences. Wes Churchman was Russ Acoff's supervisor. So uh, what, what he... Uh, said is, why don't you write a book about uh, the founding of the System Society uh, and how this came about. And so it's an interesting title, The Science of Synthesis, because for her, that's what systems does. It's a science a system of synthesis. And most sciences are about analysis, taking things apart. They're not putting things together. Uh, and in that book, she talked about the heritage of the system movement, so in around 1954, when they're looking at system society, there were four people that, were, uh, that went to form the ISSS. Uh, Ludwig von Bernalanffy is usually the one that's given the credit, and he created the term what's called general systems theory. He was a biologist. Kenneth Boulding was uh, an economist, and he was part of this group, um, and eventually he got into studying peace studies. Now, the interesting thing about uh, Kenneth Boulding, we start reading some of his work. He has this book called The Image. It's quite famous. Um, uh, he was accused of not being an economist because of his views of the world and that you know, economics could do good, economics could use peace, these sorts of things. He was accused of not being an economist at the same time he was president of the American Economic Association. So that's what system thinking does to you. You end up in this discipline and they go, oh, you know, you're a business guy, you should be so profit oriented. No, no, I don't understand. <laughs> There's a system at work here. Um, Ralph Gerard was uh, doing neurophysiology and behavioral science. He's the one that's actually written about the least. Anatole Rappaport, um, for those of you who've heard of Prisoner's Dilemma in game theory, he did a lot of the work in that. He was a mathematical uh, biolo uh, psychologist. And so he's mostly famous for doing the work on, on prisoner's dilemma. So you know, you put two prisoners in two cells. You know, does one rat on the other? You know, that sort of stuff. And in 1998, um, Anatole Rapport was at the ISSS meeting. Uh, he actually didn't give a big talk. He gave a little talk. Um, but the interesting thing was that he gave a piano conference performance because before he was a, an academic, he was a concert pianist. And so he, he did this one piece that uh, my friend sitting next to me said, someone half his age would have had a problem finishing that. And then he started a second piece and then it had to stop in the middle and said, I'm too tired. I'm sorry, I can't finish that. So, uh, so that's my, my brush with greatness from Animal Rapport, who also lived in Toronto. I biked by the house where I think he lived. Uh, because <laughs> uh, the mutual interest was in theoretical frameworks. 
systems, which were physical, technological, biological, social, and symbolic. In 1954, computer science didn't exist. So the idea of a symbolic system was yet to come about. And interdisciplinary research for a general system, a general theory of complex systems. Uh, what we find at the systems meetings, the people in the systems community, is it's everyone's second conference. Because in order to be successful in this world, you have to be really good and deep in one thing. So this is very consistent with the Creative Sustainability Program, where you come in and you're studying as a designer, you're studying as an engineer, you have real estate, construction, whatever it is, you have to be good at that one thing to be successful in the world. However, systems allows you the breadth to get around to all the other people and have conversations with a broader group of people. Elena Leonard said something about um, uh, that, that she, she studied that uh, there was a statistic that if you do not have this ground and a systems knowledge, sometimes the conversation degenerates to grade nine conversation. Because if you're a physicist and you're talking to an economist, how much do you share? And you start going down, 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 you don't have a, a common language to talk about. So getting across these fields is one of the challenges. So this leads me up, uh, I have a big jump here to 2012, and uh, Kathy was at this meeting. Um, this was a, uh, when I was the president of the ISSS, and so I organized a meeting where the theme was service systems, natural systems. And um, the question behind this was around, um, my question is, has system thinking changed? Because Russ Acoff mostly published in the 1990s, published uh, in the 1980s, 19, it's 1970s, 1980s, 1990s, and then system thinking kind of went down, and you don't see so much published. Uh, but the, the community has continued to exist, and so how has system thinking changed? And so the two areas that I thought were different that none of these people would have recognized in the 1980s were service systems, uh, and I work on service system thinking, and the second one was on the Anthropocene, which is in natural systems and resilience. So let me take the first part on, on service systems. So we start off in a world that's primarily around agricultural systems. Uh, we evolved through the Industrial Revolution to industrial systems. And we're in this new world today where uh, we, we, some have called it a uh, service economy. Um, some call it post-industrial, whatever. Um, the way this came about was in 2003, uh, being at IBM, uh, there was a director at Almaden Services, a director at the Almaden Research Lab, uh, Jim Sporer, who uh, created and started this idea called Service Science Management Engineering and Design. And the idea behind this came from IBM Corporate, because you now have the history where IBM changed from a hardware company to a services company, right? So, typical business question, okay, how much money are we spending on research? Okay, good. Uh, our revenue is like 50% services now. Um, so if we're doing research, how much research do we put into hardware, how much do we put into the services? Oh, research budget is like 1% services. Revenue is 50% of the company. There's some problem here. So Jim gets this challenge. He goes, okay, I'll look into this, right? And so he decides to create this field that's called service science because we're moving towards service economy. You know, in the industrial age, we didn't have the internet, we didn't have globalization, and now we have all this stuff going on that we don't understand. And so in 2003, Jim starts going to universities around the world. Uh, he was one of the reviewers for Alto for the merger of the universities. That's, that's how significant this was. Because IBM was coming in and, uh, and saying to the universities of the world, the students you're graduating do not have the skills that, we, that IBM wants to hire. Like, we, you, 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 universities are producing so many students and they don't have the skills. Okay, the universities go, okay, great, IBM, you're so smart. What do you want? And IBM says, I don't know. Your universities, aren't you about knowledge? Can you figure this stuff out? <laughs> um, and, and so he, Jim called it service science because he didn't know what else to call it. The service economy and we had this sort of thing going on. So the other side of it, though, is that um, uh, what he presented was that this has happened before. This happened in the 1960s. In the 1960s, IBM said, students at the university are graduating don't have the skills IBM wants to hire. And we go to the universities, and IBM would say, you know, we're looking for students. And the math department says, we have people. And we go, no, no, that's not it. Philosophy department says, we have people. No, that's not it. Electrical engineers say, we have that. We say, no, that's not it. IBM, what is it you're looking for? Well, it turned out to be this field that 
It was called computer science. If you were in 1960 and you said you were doing computer science, people go, there's no science in computing. And everyone today, everyone here says, oh, computer science has existed forever. No, computer science has not existed forever. And an IEEE article that says that, that, service, that, that, that computer science would not have existed except that IBM started going around doing this sort of thing. So IBM's doing the same thing now. And it says, we want service economy, we want people, you know, we want like this. And so, so here in Helsinki, you guys don't understand the bigger context for the Innovation University and what Alto University was about. Because Alto University, in this reorganization, was to tackle this problem. It's to do a service economy. And so I, I, I was looking on the web pages yesterday, I understand we went over to Oteniemi yesterday, and, uh, and so I saw the building all wrapped up, and I go, what the heck's going on here? And I read the web pages, like, oh, all the undergraduate students are going to be together. The, the business students and the engineering students and the design students are all going to be together in one building. It's like, wow. Okay, that's what this is all about. It takes a long time to do that. But that's associated with this idea that there is a new economy and there's something happening and we don't understand what it is. We can call this service science for now, it's computer science, but we don't really know until afterwards. If you look at um, material versus, no, so let's say we get this axis, right? I get this confused. Uh, products versus services. <laughs> this, is a, this is a funny chart to try to do. So let me, let me do it this way. Um, in the economy, this is an old study, but this is material and products. So think about this as automobiles, and this is information and services. If you are working in the automobile industry, that's not much fun because it's, it's shrinking. If you're working, in the, working for Google, it's great because that's a part of the economy that's big. If you look at economies today, most of the major economies in the world, the service economies, they order like 70% of the GDP. And that's what this is about. So what do we mean by service system? Now, we get into service science. Again, there are people who are disciplinary in that. And so we have service system science. Uh, Jim Kojima from Tokyo phrased that. But service systems, um, Jim Spore uh, was working on an NSF um, uh, um, discussion. And he said, OK, let's think about this in terms of what a, what a school curriculum could be, bought, could be like from kindergarten. And so we have systems that move, store, harvest, and process. So what you want to do is in kindergarten, you have to get your kid on the tram to take them to school, or you walk them to school. Um, you have them understand a transportation system, basically. We have water and waste management, so they need to understand that water doesn't just come out of the tap. It comes from uh, processing. You can take them to a water plant, um, teach them about that. Uh, food and uh, global supply chain. So people think that uh, meat comes out of a supermarket already wrapped. So I would take it to a farm. And I'm just going to that. that. Energy and energy grid, just plugging into the wall doesn't do things. And uh, by grade four, uh, they've already got the mobile phone, which probably tell them you don't just talk to people by magic. That's something technology should understand how that works. There are systems that enable healthy, wealthy, and wise people. Building and construction is a big service industry. Uh, banking and finance, retail and hospitality, healthcare is a big system. You don't really get to understand that until grade eight, because as a system, it's really complicated. Um, that education, including universities, by grade nine you might talk about uh, what they've been doing in school for the last nine years, because they just kind of go every day. Uh, finally, you have systems that govern uh, cities, uh, grade 10, grade 11, reasoning the states. Grade 12, government, national systems are really actually quite hard to understand because they're really abstract. But this is a different way of thinking about service systems. But why is co-governance? Co-governance is missing. That's really sort of <laughs> um, okay so so then we'd have to define what the system is and what the services that it provides so it, it depends yeah yeah okay so that was the one theme which was services and the other theme was on um, on uh, natural systems uh, how many people know what the Anthropocene is okay so hopefully you'll get this in the course um, Anthropocene is, uh, in effect, uh, the research behind global warming. Um, and we are in this period where it was called the Holocene, which is stable. So um, this is the last 10,000 years we've been in a stable state. Uh, and it's science here where they try to look at the temperature of the world. 
Uh, but what's happened is we've approached this period called the Anthropocene, where the biggest impact on the world um, as, as a physical system is because of human intervention. So there are deniers out there, but in effect, human beings can influence the ecology. There are a lot of people who say, oh, you know, just leave the ecology alone, it'll, it'll come back. And it's like, no, you can actually kill things. So the Stockholm Resilience Center had created these planetary boundaries, and the question was, if we look at the Earth system processes, have we gone too far that we can't, we can't reverse? And so what they said is on climate change, it's too late. We've lost. We're in a system. We've gone past the regime. We have to adapt to the new system because the old system of climate is not going back. Biodiversity loss. It's too late. Uh, and nitrogen cycle. And this has to do with um, the way we fertilize and, and, uh, and uh, fertilize land and grow things. It's, it's pretty bad. Phosphorus, some of these other things are, are uh, still, um, we can still reverse. Um, this is the graphic that you normally have. And so you look at it, and this is pretty dramatic about, about trying to create um, an idea where uh, people pay attention to what's happening in the world. But this, again, is all systems thinking. It is Now, what is the system? The system is a planetary system. You look at that system, and the question is how would you influence that and change things? And this is where the movement towards socio-ecological systems come. Because fundamentally, this is a study of earth sciences plus anthropology, plus sociology, plus politics. Now in this, we have um, a part of the, uh, of the IBM initiatives I was working on when I was there was the idea of smarter planet, smarter cities. And there's been changes where you have a combination of the service system and potentially some things in the monitoring uh, uh, in, in the physical world. And so the changes that have happened over the last 10 years have been our world becoming instrumented, interconnected, and intelligent. And this was the sort of thing that we're supposed to learn uh, so what do we mean by that? And, and when I say inter instrumented, interconnected, and intelligent, uh, the best way for me to understand that is to do the opposite. So what is it they don't mean? Um, because we're talking about converging physical and digital infrastructures. So everyone here has heard about the Internet of Things, but this is maybe a few years back before they decided to call it the Internet of Things, right? So the world is becoming instrumented. We used to have this world where the world was invisible or unobserved. So we didn't used to have big data. Uh, one, of the one of the things that you could look at um, that's interesting, go to the website Big Data University. Uh, because what's happening is that IBM has decided that universities are not getting up to speed on big data fast enough. So they're, they've created Big Data University online, free courses, uh, somewhat easy, they're doing like five minute videos, five five minute videos and then you can get a certification, you put in a LinkedIn profile, and say so you've taken the course. Um, uh, but it's, it's IBM way of, of saying universities wake up. <laughs> this, you know, you gotta keep them up. Because it's a combination of, um, of computer science, uh, statistics, and also domain knowledge. So uh, it turns out that after looking at this, I was hired into IBM as what they call a data scientist in 1985. But they didn't call it data science. I was doing econometrics, I, and and then I helped in 1991 found the Center for Marketing Information Technologies at University of Toronto, and I was doing marketing science at that point, which is also data science. And people didn't know what to call it that. Um, the second is the world becoming interconnected. We have, uh, used to have analog and synchronous connections, person to person, and machine to machine, and, and now it's all digital, right? Everything is digital. We don't think about it anymore. Uh, I don't know if, how many of you play with Arduino machines. Arduino is great. Uh, open source hardware sort of stuff. Uh, so we're moving towards that, that we're actually being able to monitor the Internet of Things and we're making the physical world and the digital world um, uh, less uh, separate. And virtually everything is becoming intelligent. And this thing, things used to be done around unresponsive action. People don't think about their mobile phones, about you know, how much intelligence is built into their phone. But in effect, what happens is that we used to have a world where no one had mobile phones. It's not that long ago. Actually, when I came to Finland, I used to get lost a lot because we didn't have smartphones at that point. So just to wrap up, there's other things that have been happening along the way. There is a system science working group. Um, this is uh, you, can, you can search on it on Google. 
This is a, a, a group that is jointly between the International Society of System Scientists and Systems Engineering Community. Um, this, this, this is a funny association because um, I help initiate this, and the reason I want to do this is that systems engineers have different perspectives, and one of the things that they do is that systems engineers often work up in a project management practice, and so what they do is they have deadlines, and this meeting has been the best about getting things done. Now, you have to ask the question, do they do it right? Because Russ Acoff says there's, there's two things that you, there's two ways to do things. There's one of doing the right thing wronger or the wrong thing righter. Which do you want to do? Do you want to do the right thing wronger or the wrong thing righter? Um, and actually, the engineers have said we often do the wrong thing righter. Uh, but that's why the system science people are there. But system science people are bad because it takes them a long time to do stuff. They're scientists, right? So having things on a six-month deadline is not necessarily good. The combination of the two means that, in effect, in COSI people drive the project because they already have the date scheduled. Every six months they meet. And, uh, and they have system, people, system science people come in and they meet and they bring in ideas and we exchange and they make progress. So there's a lot of activities in the forums. Um, they have their workshops well documented. Um, and it's been a very successful and fruitful direction. The second one is the Systemic Design Research Network. Uh, Peter Jones is at um, OCAD University in Toronto, which uh, we consider the Ontario College of Art and Design. So it's the equivalent of Tyke here. And in effect, Peter Jones is the equivalent uh, of, in the Strategic Foresight Innovation Program, is the equivalent of the Creative Sustainability Program here. So it's a Canadian version of the same sort of ideas done a little bit differently. But it's created this, uh, uh, this idea of relating system thinking and design, and he's been running um, this conference. Uh, this year, it, it's done primarily with AHO, uh, the architecture school in Oslo, uh, where they've been doing a lot of work on um, uh, mega mapping. Um, uh, but uh, this year he had it in, uh, in Banff, and next year he's having it in Toronto, so for the, about this time of year. It probably conflict with your school schedule, but it's a fun conference because there you get designers and, uh, and the system thinkers and uh, um, putting these things together. <coughs> so recently, and the last time I came here, I was talking about service system thinking. Now we have a little context for why I've been doing that, because what I've been trying to do is take the service economy ideas and move that stuff forward. I am a social scientist, I'm not a ecologist, uh, so that, that'll be my contribution. I recognize the Anthropocene exists, I try to do stuff to help it, but that's not my area of research. So the idea has been, has been around um, using pattern language from architecture. Uh, that's a longer talk. For those of you who really want the longer talk, you can watch the video. But essentially the idea is that between 1975 and 1979, uh, the architecture professor from Berkeley, Christopher Alexander, he created this series of books. Uh, a pattern language is the one that's best known, and it talks about towns building constructions. Um, and um, this was picked up. Yeah, this was picked up by uh, uh, the software development community, and so people heard about agile. You know, agile development that came out of this um, in a roundabout way. Uh, but uh, what I recommend, and what I've been asking, encouraging people to do, is actually look at this book, "The Battle for Life and Beauty of the Earth," because this is a, a, a recent book, and these ones are quite old. Um, and what happens, history of science, is that when you, if you actually read uh, Alexander over a long period of time, he changes the words he uses. So it's really confusing. So if you're going to read Alexander, I recommend you read backwards. Read from, the, read from 2012 and work backwards. Because if you start here and start going forwards, you're going to say, but he, you know, he changed the word. He used to call it wholeness. And he, called, you know, he used to call it quality without a name. And now he calls it wholeness. What, what's that all about? So I've been working on this um, primarily as pattern language, and so I went back to uh, 1969 for the context of Christopher Alexander, and this idea of problem seeking and problem solving and solution. And so you want to separate the idea of problem seeking from problem solving. For those of you, I'll, I, I'll debate this afterwards, but what's happening is the definitions I look at, in effect, design is problem solving, architecture should be problem seeking we're back in architectural programming, right? And this is very much tied in with um, the period in the 1970s when Christopher Alexander was at Berkeley. 
Uh, how many of you heard the, you know, the, the uh, idea of wicked problems? There are wicked problems? Okay, everyone's heard of wicked problems. There are two ways to approach wicked problems. One is the Horst Rattel approach, um, and, and the way that he does it, and that ends you up in design theory, ends you up with argumentation schemes. What you are trying to do is create a clearer definition of what the problems are and how to approach them, and create arguments around it. The opposing way of doing that is Christopher Alexander. Christopher Alexander describes the world and describes it in patterns that all network together. So in effect, when you look at Horst Rattel's way of doing it, it is a complex systems view. When you look at Alexander's way of doing it, it is a complicated systems view. Ah, it took me a while to figure this one out. <laughs> See, I learned too. It takes me a while, but it takes me a while to learn. <laughs> so, so I like Alexander because it's complicated. But if you're actually in an argumentation scheme, then it, like you could start talking about how is it that we're actually going to influence um, the Anthropocene? How is it we're going to get responses to, to, to uh, climate change? There's a complex way to do it, and there's a complicated way to do it. And one is not necessarily better than the other. They're different, and part of that's wrapped up in in these ideas. Um, and so, uh, I'm not going to go through this because um, we don't have time. Teleology, purposes. A teleology, not having purposes. So, we had ecological systems before, it's related to that. Christopher Alexander is on the right side. Russ Acoff, Horst Rattel are on the left side. They're all systems thinkers, and people can break them up in different ways, but it's a way of putting all these things together. So, what am I doing in service system thinking? I've been uh, working now in Federated Wiki. Now, this is board history of science of putting things together. What, when was Wiki invented and why was it invented? Wiki was invented by Ward Cunningham for the software development community to develop a pattern language for software development. So Wiki was invented for pattern language. And in the last couple of years, Ward Cunningham has said, we did it wrong. This is not what Wiki was supposed to be. The idea that is fundamentally behind the idea of the smallest federated Wiki is that all of us should individually have Wikis. We all have our own Wikis. The problem with Wiki today is people think of Wiki as Wikipedia. If you have Wikipedia, there is one truth in the world. Because people, you, know, you, you get into an argument, people say, but Wikipedia says this, and you go, Wikipedia is wrong. No, Wikipedia says this, it must be right. No, no, no. So what he says is that we should all have wikis. And we network them together, and what we do is that we have the ability so that when I can copy your page over to mine, I can make a change, and then when I make a change, you know that I've made a change, and if you think it's better, you copy it back. And we have a network of wikis. So again, we have Wikipedia, complex solution, federated wiki, complicated solution. Okay. So the systems ideas come in, and um, this is um, a little bit early. So for those of you who uh, manage websites and do stuff like that, um, you can get a Federated Wiki put up. For those of you who are um, not yet uh, that technologically savvy, there's going to be a few new technologies coming out that should support Federated Wiki, so you can do it. So let's say human beings can do it as opposed to computer sciences. So in the last year, I've been uh, working on uh, getting uh, service system science, working across these communities, uh, and working. So the most recent one, the other one I went to the summer, Purple Sock, uh, the Pursuit of Pattern Language Societal Change Conference. This is um, alternated now. This has been uh, alternated with the uh, Pearl Conference. So there's a Portland Urban Architecture Research Lab, uh, where Christopher Alexander people are all, all in Portland right now. And, and so they've associated with this conference. And so uh, this one's focused on social change, but in next year, the conference will be run um, by the people in Portland they will have in San Francisco. Uh, but uh, this is, I, I've been working in, towards that direction because I need people that actually understand pattern language order to move the services forward. Okay, I'm going to skip through to the end and talk about why we do systems thinking. Um, this is a paper that was written quite a long time ago. Uh, Mina Takala is my friend. Uh, she's, a, she's the reason I got here in 2003. And Ian Simmons, my, co my uh, I, uh, a colleague I'm in research, we wrote this article uh, quite a long time ago about uh, ignorance. 
So this is a map of ignorance. This was developed for uh, the at University of Arizona in the College of Medicine because doctors are trained to be certain. So there's nothing worse than going to a doctor and the doctor says, you have cancer. And the first question is, are you sure? And the doctors are trained to be sure because when they talk to their patients, they need to provide that confidence and give them guidance and support. However, doctors need to understand that medicine is an art and there's science associated with it and there are things that people don't know. So, there are igno there's ignorance and there's different types of ignorance. There is known unknowns, all the things that you know you don't know. Known unknowns are really good because if you know you don't know something, you can go do research. So today I've lectured, I've given you a whole bunch of terms, you go, I don't know exactly what that means, I'll go to Wikipedia, I'll look at the dictionary, I'll do some more reading. That's a really good thing. There are errors, all the things that you think you know but you don't. When you have an error, the only way you can detect an error in yourself is to have a conversation with someone else. Because in order for it to be an error, someone else has to tell you you're wrong. And if you have good friends, they will tell you wrong. There are unknown knowns, all the things that you don't know you already know. So people know things, they learn things over time, but they don't necessarily associate them. So a lot of you know how to swim. You know, if I said, okay, I'm gonna throw you in the pool right now, and are you gonna drown? It's just something you already know, and you don't have to relearn it. So it's something you don't think about, you know how to walk, you know how to get to school in the morning, we don't teach you all the different things. We have unknown unknowns. All the things you don't know, you don't know. This is where system thinking is really important. There are a lot of unknown unknowns. You don't know that you don't know, and so you need to have a community around you to help you work on that. And there are a lot of problems where there are unknown unknowns, and systems is really good for doing that. Finally, there are taboos and denials. Taboos are dangerous, uh, polluting, or forbidden knowledge, and, and people don't discuss them because they're not discussable. And denials, all things that are too painful, no, so you don't. And, and, that, and again, sometimes systems communities help you get through all those. So to close, I welcome you to, um, I'm very active on Google, Google Plus. There's a Google Plus community, so if you search on system scientists, you'll find it. And I post all sorts of stuff. Uh, there's also a Facebook group, but you'll t you won't find it in the Facebook group because Facebook group is too noisy. So if you want to keep up with what I'm doing, uh, you can go over to Google Plus, it's not too noisy. I post stuff every once in a while. Um, and um, that's it. So for those, I will see, uh, I'll be observing your class tomorrow. I'm not officially in your class tomorrow. Yeah, can, can you uh, raise your hands for what? in the class tomorrow? So quite many of okay. you. That's Good. nice. We got plus, uh, Glenn, how many was it? We have 40, 42 people coming in the class okay. tomorrow. Good. So it's going to be a great thing you. that you join us. <laughs> we have, would you stay the whole day? From yeah, I'll, I'll be there all day. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. we have. Uh, my talk in the morning, and we start from the Anthropocene, more or less. Did you receive your first kind of pre-task? Yeah, so you saw something familiar also here. And then we have the full day before Gary's lecture at, at 3 o'clock, okay. so that you can work with the students, and that's going to be a great okay. Thank you for the talk. That was wonderful. So I wonder if you have We get the slides. Yes, the, they're, they're on the website. So okay. And what about the film for the people who didn't? Uh, everything everything is on. Mm -hmm. Oh, for for that uh, that one that one will take a while. I'll get the yeah. audio for you next week, yes. but uh, the video yeah. will take a while. And guys, okay. uh, if you have any questions now, you could also ask now, maybe. Yeah. yeah. But but it's, it's twelve, so we could close and then uh, okay. I could talk to people separately. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. All right. See you tomorrow. Thank you.